welcome up our moderator, um, Ann Thompson, editor at large from IndieWire. And please give a very warm welcome to the director, Sandy Tan. movie and I think part of what I love about it is this it reminds me of my youthful cinephile self you know you know devouring the the work of, of Susan Sontag and you know being very smart about it and 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 trying hard to be uh, the, the know-it-all and I and I really um, wondered what was the person that you thought you were going to be versus what you became as a result of not finishing this movie? Um, that's a tough one. I think I would think I was such a, I mean, you know, the 16-year-old self would have thought I was, you know, such a fucking loser for being so old and, and coming, coming to this so late. Because the 16-year-old self would not have imagined that I would have, you know, experienced those roadblocks uh, and that, that strange detour that circumstances had put me through um, and would have just imagined that things would have been, you know, perfectly, not easy, but um, that I would have just been chugging along and just realizing my dreams and, and not realizing that, you know, things do happen that are, you know, strange and... So the three of you really had no choice but to just pick up and move on. You, you had no choice. Um, yeah, we, we had no choice because it's, you know, the thing is when this, this, this happens to you, uh, this was in a place where, you know, a lot of people don't seem to remember that in the 90s, um, you know, the, the internet didn't quite exist yet. It was really hard to look for um, somebody who, who vanished. Um, and, you know, basically three teenage girls trying to make a film with their friends were all teenagers, um, a strange film, we have to admit. And, um, you know, like people, People would not weren't very sympathetic and would not have been very sympathetic to us, um, you know. Like just I don't know. Like they, they, they you know, when, when this thing went missing, it, it was we didn't have help. I mean, there was nobody we could go to for backup. Um, there was no proof. I mean, first of all, there was no proof. And and talking about this film, you know, as you know, you've just seen the images. There was no proof for decades. There was no way we could have prove, proven that you know we had captured something really special. We had shot in a hundred locations with over a hundred extras, and like you know that nobody had done anything like this before, and nobody quite understood the enormity of this. Like you know, like going into a school and grabbing kids and stealing old folks from old folks' <laughs> home and just like hijacking buses to do this crazy thing. Like nobody outside of this little group understood or would believe that this ever happened. And then one of the, the greatest things, I mean, the heartbreak was having gone through that, having this thing taken away from us and nobody believing us, like, and then having to kind of reopen the wound and, and, and search for this guy and, and, and confront him and not finding him. I mean, like, people blame us for not looking harder, but they don't quite understand, like, what it is to have gone through so many levels of heartbreak. I love the part of the story where you and the and your uh, cohort, uh, his friend Tyler, I think is Stephen, Stephen Tyler. Tyler yeah. yeah, you become detectives, and and, and I love that. Um, there's there's a question um, of of what would have been the place that this movie would hold in Singapore cinematic history. Uh, it would have been the first independent film, I think. Um, it would have been the first road movie. It certainly would have been the first movie of this kind, um, and um, I, you know, it's it, that's for the historians to, to, to you know, quibble over and and you know, talk about. I guess um, Sophie is a, a film historian of that subject matter, and um, she would have thoughts on that. But and she insists that it's like you know, it should be in the history books. It should have been registered. It was just. It, it, it just never, was never completed, so therefore, you you know, it wouldn't be there. I liked that line of hers about how it was a ghost yeah. in, in the pages of, of the Yeah, history. I mean, the thing is, I mean, the thing, though, is, like, the, the filmmakers who, and the friends who, who, who know that scene think that it really would have changed things, because it really would have been, you know, like, showing people that just go out and do this, you, you know, you can have fun doing this thing, and, and even if it's, even if it turned out looking really silly and, and not playing anywhere and um, you know maybe I don't know I mean there's a part of me that thinks that if this film had been made and put together and was as uh, 
you know, as exhaustingly kooky as it was, uh, I, I think a lot of, um, you know, people might have laughed us out of town, and I, I would be a lawyer right now. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I know that the images are silent, so we really have no way of judging, mm -hmm. but the, the, uh, Cardona wasn't a bad director. No. You see, that's the thing. It's quite I, I'm beautiful. Not sure he's, I'm not sure he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good director. I think he, he didn't really direct. But well, it's, 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 it's Jasmine? No, no, no. Uh, all of us, um, you know, kind of coming together and, and just, you know, he, he just, what he was, was he was a very good cinematographer and he would have been, you know, he could have had a real career if he hadn't, you know, made his thing. Um, he was a very creative guy. I mean, his, the way he creates is by taking away, and that I find fascinating. I mean, he's a man who kind of lives out the novel of his life by um, creating absences in other people's lives, and just, like, you know, that's, that's the way he creates, because he's never actually finished or done anything, um, you know, I guess tangible in his life. He's never finished anything. So, um, he's, you know, he's a very good photographer and cinematographer. He's, he frames for those, those, those things really well, and I think he had a really good eye. I mean, he was the one who taught me to be really interested in Robbie Mueller and um, Nessa Elmendros. He's, he was obsessed with those guys, and we would, you know, go, like, looking at old buildings and taking pictures of old buildings and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he was really, really inspiring and, and it's, you know, and, um, but the thing is, he... He just wasn't a director, um, and I think it freaked him out that these these girls like like he just never thought we would get to the point where we would get free film from Kodak, free equipment, and all these kids like coming together and you know like just melting melting the show and finding all the extras and stealing the buses and stealing the old people and like a hundred locations. I mean, like he just never thought this would actually happen. He just thought it would just completely. So you know, being in the realm of, of just talk and play. I mean, he's a man who is just is a is a is a, just a prolific storyteller, and his world exists within stories, not reality. So um, you know, when we we start turning this thing into something that was real, it just like we ran with it, and he was, based, he was just like terrified. I mean, he just just didn't know what to do, and I think one of the reasons why um, he did what he did was probably because he was just he just never thought he would get to the point where he had to complete the film or edit the film or what do you do when you, how do you edit a film? I mean, it's never actually done that. So when you got the boxes and you yeah. got, you started going through all this, I mean, what was your reaction to looking at this footage? Okay, so this is the thing. When the boxes started coming to my house, I was, I had, you know, I was grown up. I was a novelist in LA. I left this heartbreaking thing behind and just hidden it and never talked about it. All my friends, you know, some of whom are in this room, like, you know, that do, did not know that this this whole thing happened to me because I just never talked about it, and um, so these boxes would begin uh, arriving my house, and I would stack them up so as to occupy the the least amount of space. And so there were about seven boxes all in all, and I just would stack them in this corner of my living room. And soon they resembled this kind of a vertical coffin, uh, this like sarcophagus um, standing in my living room, and. And, and the sarcophagus stood in my living room for like years because um, I just didn't want to deal with opening them up and just dealing with this Pandora's Doris box of... Basically, I was embroiled in this horrible um, act of vanity. I just didn't want to look at myself as a teenager. And so I was, I was terrified of confronting what was in there. And it was, you know, it's been like, maybe it was like three or four years and my husband finally said, you know, what are you gonna do with this? Like, will you just get this stuff out of the house? <laughs> and so I finally took these boxes off to, um, this place in Burbank, the only, one of the few places that knows what to do with 16. There aren't that many left, as you know. And uh, I you know, found a place that does those um, DVD, well, Criterion Blu-rays for, uh, you know, for um, Douglas Sirk movies, because they had the color and, you know, the guy who, who colored the Douglas Sirk movie, I, I was thinking, I want you, I want that guy. So I, I went and we, 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 um, we, we, we got those, those those 700 minutes, those 70 reels, 700 minutes oh, wow. of 16, uh, and when you know, and George was such a crazy person that each of these little reels were like wrapped in black plastic, everyone individually, so that when you open them up, they were pristine, and everybody at the lab thought I was like punking them, like there's no way this is from 25 years ago. I mean, it had to be like maybe three years ago. And he was air conditioning them. And yeah, yeah. So so finally. Um, you know, we digitized this stuff, and, and I sat next to the guy um, looking at the footage, and, and he was like, his jaw dropped, and he was like, wow, 
this is amazing. And that's when I first had this inkling that there was a story here. I had to do something with it. It's not about me anymore. It's like all these amazing people were giving amazing performances who might have had careers. I mean, the woman who played the nurse, I think she actually wanted to be an actress. Like, could, have, could have been an actress, maybe. Um, you know, she was actually really good. And like all these 18 year old production designers doing, you know, like amazing production design, like we did this. And, and I was just like, I had to just get over the fact that I just didn't want to see myself. And it was about, it was about everybody else. And then I, um, I had to, you know, just figure out how to do this. And I, um, I actually, by accident, uh, ran into Iris Ng, this photographer, Iris Ng, who shot Stories We Tell um, with Sarah Polly. And, um, you know, we, 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 I told her a little bit about what I was doing, and she said, let's just go. Let's just go and get some interviews, because she had done this with Sarah Polly. So it's kind of like, you know, Sarah didn't want to be on camera either, and she, but she was shooting her, you know, and then finally they used her in the footage. Um, and so she did the same with me, and we went to Singapore, and we went across the U.S. and interviewed a bunch of people. And then I sat down and, and realized that what I was doing was kind of like enacting what Shirker's the original film was, which is like, I played a character who was going around picking, auditioning, people to be part of my tribe right. and and what I was doing now is like picking people like just choosing handpicking these people to be part of this larger project this larger tribe from around the world and kind of like you know restoring this this project and bringing it back to life rather than killing them as in the original um, but, so I was like re, kind of making a remake of a movie that was never actually made um, you know what I mean, but but it's you know, but 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 with a, a brand new set of collaborators, we're gonna bring this whole Shirker story to life. So in the end, you must it it looks like you spent a lot of time in the editing room. Yes, um, it was. Um, I made this in my garage, and I think it's a remarkably empowering thing to realize, you know, suddenly that you're not the sorcerer's apprentice anymore; you're the sorcerer. I think a lot of filmmakers would realize that when you're sitting in front of the editing bay that you can you can do anything. Um, and I, I did this in my garage with, I, I could not afford a professional editor, so I, I worked with um, this guy I found um, who was, he had one assistant editing um, credit to his name and he was a barista and a skateboarder. His name is Lucas Seller, He's a, he was very young, he's a kid. And uh, we completely bonded on music, and because I, I thought, you know, what I had to do to get to, to make this film was I had to get myself into the the mind frame, um, the the you know, I had to marinate in my teenage mania for a while before I could sort of get into the the mood. And once I could get into the mood, I could relive that that kind of the, the joy of filmmaking that I had lost over the years, and then I can tell the story. So it was very important to me to find a co-pilot who is um, maybe not so experienced, but who was eager, I mean, who was willing, not eager, but willing, <laughs> to, <laughs> to sit with me and endure this nine months of, uh, you know, I have to say, it, it's not gender to say, it's like birthing, but it was like a nine month birthing process, not always pretty, um, you know, with this, with, with this kid, Lucas, um, who was, you know, had, had no real experience, but, but was really open to trying things, like ideas with me, and he was, um, he told me, okay, so this is Lucas, and you may, he may have some friends here, so don't tell him I said this, because I really, I really think he's great. Um, he, he said, he said that, he, you know, I know that he was a Photoshop genius, but he said he was an After Effects genius as well, because I needed to move things around the screen, and I couldn't afford to send it off for, like, to some After Effects genius that you paid thousands of dollars to. So I, I had Lucas, um, and he said it was, he, he knew how to do this, and he, he obviously didn't. And, um, <laughs> and I love that, and I love that, because he had the balls to just kind of, like, lie to me, and then, we were, we were like this, we would discover how to do this together in person, and I realized there was some something very collaborative and something very true to the, the spirit of the original Shirkers, a real kind of DIY, um, you know, spirit where you can actually get this thing done. And then, um, of course, I had the guidance of um, you know more seasoned editors who came in at the end, and was also kind of you know advising me along the side. So yeah, let, let's get into that. So at a certain point you had been uh, a film critic for many years and you had been a novelist. Not so many, but a few. Yeah. Not yeah, so many. Yeah. And, and and then you uh, <laughs> nobody, yeah, right. And, <laughs> and then and then you and then you went back to film school. So I, I'm curious about that decision. Um it Columbia. was yeah. I wondered if that was a good experience even. <laughs> 
Uh, be honest. I'm not going to say that in public because people do get in trouble for saying the truth about these things. Um, <laughs> but you know, but but really, um, I it was you know it was I would I wanted to get close to film, and the closest I could get to film when I was in Singapore back then as a film critic was to write about them. Um, you know, my soul, I, my heart was broken by the the, the loss of, of of Sherpas, and it was just like some of this. This thing I couldn't even talk about because there was no proof it ever happened, and um, it you know being a film critic was the closest I could to to kind of learn and, and just bide my time and figure out what to do next. Um, and going to film school, I thought was well, going to get me close again, but I mean the t the timing of that was kind of uh, uh, unfortunate slightly because that was when that was in the, I went to film school in the late '90s, and that was when I think indie film was kind of dying and that was before TV was kind of taking off so a lot of my friends we took a long time to kind of find our way into you know our world and you know since since then like one of my friends has recently um, like won the Pulitzer Prize for plays I guess and then another friend is producing and, and she's produced this too um, she's producing Maniac and Godless for Netflix and then another friend is uh, producing X-Men movies so but it's taken us a while um, but you know so it, it, you know that's that's it's a very mixed bag I have to say I, I'm not completely for film school there but <laughs> but 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 now I mean like if you can learn a trade like the, the problem with some of those films okay I'm gonna get in so much trouble now Do it. Do, and somebody's recording this right so can you just cut this part like back in those days back in those days doesn't apply to now um, back in those days um, we weren't really taught practical things so like we didn't know like Columbia produces auteurs they immediately want you to be a writer director you're gonna be a you know, alter. It's gonna be no problem, and yeah. you're gonna write your own things and direct your own things, and you don't have to learn how to work the camera. You don't have to learn to edit anything. You don't have to learn how things work in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, a lot of film schools here do teach you to do much more than that. And so uh, I, I have just, oh, I'm just so stupid. I just walked into that trap. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's that that was my feeling. But where did Sundance come in? Uh, Sundance Institute or. Oh, um, in, 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 in the workshops. I did not do the workshops. You did something. I did, um, I, they gave me um, some money, <laughs> which is nice in a workshop. But, so um, talk about that. You have some pretty fancy film clips. You've got some song, you know, music. You've got some money somewhere uh, along the way. Yeah, and then um, that was made for very little money. And then, and then there was um, Sundance gave us money and Sunny Reach, which is a great organization. Uh, gave us money, and then um, it was a loan as well. Um, and you know, because it was very, very, I mean, it's really hard to talk people, talk, you know, convince them that I could make this. I mean, when I had nothing to show for it, and it was, it was incredibly difficult. And you, you just had to, uh, you know, you had to take a lot of risks on your own, and, and you know, take loans and stuff. So you got into Sundance, yeah, and you went to Sundance, okay. and and you were reunited. Yeah, I went to Sundance and we, we brought everybody um, and it was Jasmine, me and Sophie had not been in the same room in like 20 years until we, when we got to Sundance, it was kind of, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was interestingly challenging, but luckily I had like 15 people to stand between me and Jasmine so we'd, we would not come to blows, but it was great, I mean she had a great time, like she had a, such a great time um, like being in the vicinity of RuPaul. Um, who's a hero, and like going to movies every day, and going to see things, and you know she she was so excited. But in front of me, she was just like, I hate being here. It's like she just will not give me the pleasure of, you know, because it was it was due to me that I was inviting her and blah blah blah, and she just didn't want to give me that pleasure of, you know. So, but I knew she had a good time because because everybody else on the crew, she told like she was having such a good time. They knew and they were in. You know, around her, and they knew she was having a good time. So, I know Jasmine. I know. If you're part of this. So, so the good news is, after that uh, extremely well-received Sundance uh, uh, event, what well, you got picked up by Netflix. Yeah. So, what kind of contributions did they make afterwards? Um, they're great. They they helped with this. Um, I guess. I guess. Um, and they 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 um they they're fantastic. A amazing group of people to work with. They actually um, did not ask for any changes. Uh, you know, we just added a few names in the credits. Um, and um, you know, and, I mean, good names though. I mean, really good names. Smart people. I like. 
I mean, I'm not even just saying that because I have to say that, but because I actually mean it. I do. They're good people. Um, and um, that's it. And then they'll be on their... Oh, and they're, and they're, they're amazing because they made trailers and stuff that are playing on the... the um, the service they call it right now, and and which is why I've been avoiding looking at the service because I hate looking at myself. Um, <laughs> but it's it's there, and and you know it's they they they're getting out they're getting this movie out to 195 countries in 25 oh, languages. Wow. So I think it's kind of amazing that wow. these kids in Bhutan can be watching this on their 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 watches and their phones while they're herding their sheep or something. It's just like I, I just I just want people to watch this movie. Like people in small places that were like me who had no, no access to, you know, like all the the glories of New York and LA and and just you know people. I mean, one of my things that I said when they asked me when they were about to, be, to buy the film was how important was this. Uh, how important was it to you to have this movie be have a theatrical run? And I said, I love this movie on the big screen. I'm so glad you saw it on the big screen. Although the, the sound should have been like a little higher, a little louder. Um, I wasn't here to micromanage, so that for it was. Uh, but um, I'm so glad you saw it on the big screen because I think that's how it should be seen, best seen. Um, but I do think it's also an earbuds movie because I, I, you know, it's, it's me exhorting, you know, 15 year olds, um, 22 year olds, 35 years, 55 years. Uh, to just like go and finish their projects and just go and do things and I, I do think it's a very personal thing I want to be talking to people personally and um, I do think that if you can show this movie in small little you know Croatian towns or Vietnam or you know places like that where, where you know people wouldn't have a multiplex to go see an art movie and you know hear me talking to them and telling them to just go and do, do stuff. So did you feel a sense of healing or closure? Um, I think it's. I think it's. You know, the whole process of this, this making this movie was, was a whole. It, it was this incredibly empowering. Um, you know, like just rediscovery of my love for making movies. Um, so that was that was the the great closure for me um, was to realize that, you know, like when you're making this film, it's kind of like an. It's kind of like being a magician. It's like the best job in the world. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you people out there who make films know this already. So I'm just like being redundant, but it's just amazing. And then, and then I got to work with. Um, so, so the healing came in this way. Like I got to find a new tribe of people to bring the story to life with. Like for example, um, Lawrence Everson, who I have to shout out to because I think he's the best sound designer in LA and, and he works with the Ross Brothers and I was lucky enough to work with him and it was like I, I had the luxury of talking to him about this project a year before we worked together and um, I you know was was talking to him about sound ideas and like how you bring um, you know something where well, we don't have a lot of footage first of all of George you don't have a lot of footage of things that happened back then or photos so how do you do how do you evoke this and a lot of this thing is through sound I mean you you, you know sound is one of the most neglected neglected terrains, I think, in, in, in documentary filmmaking, and realizing that sound is this huge thing to be tapped was so liberating. And we assigned, for example, we had this long ongoing conversation for a year, and we assigned like George and his memory a kind of a sudden metallic sting or sting sound. And you know, and, and the, 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 the reels of film had their own like aura, this, their own sound, and you know, things are moving back and forwards through time. Well, you, you can play sound uh, backwards and forwards and play with it, because that's, that's how memory and, you know, memory and emotions work. And we're trying to get at emotions and memory, and I think one of the great things, you know, to play with the sound, and so yeah, long yeah. No, that's long great, and I and I loved the the uh, the description of the movie as this kind of uh, scrapbook brought to life. Um, you 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 used everything. We used everything because um, being from a background where I was um, you know in zines and working with scraps, I was actually very. Uh, I just did not just instantly discard all the bits and pieces, and I would. You know, like I cherish and value all the things in the margins, and you know, you realize you can, you, you know, you can use these things and kind of find magic and reality and verite really in in the bits of um, like um, you know, you know, footage where Jasmine is like giving me the stink eye and I'm giving you know Jasmine the stink eye and George is all <laughs> doing something. So those bits of things were so precious to us, and you know, scrapbooking all these pieces and bringing them together. Um, was such a joy. I also love the way you were willing to to take uh, your relationships with these women and and reveal yourself in in little bits of film. You know, not looking positive. You know, or lovable. 
I you know I tried to be as real as possible, and I tried to be um, as honest as possible. And you know, Jasmine, Sophie's a dear. I mean, if you met Sophie, she's like a dear. She's like the nicest person in the world, and the most honest and trustworthy. And um, Jasmine is a challenge, uh, but that's why she's so interesting. Um, and she 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 just would not like she she's. Okay, so when I asked her to be interviewed for this film, she she wanted me to like run lines with her. I said, "What? Run lines with you? This is not you know like can we rehearse this?" And I said, "No. I mean like there's no way." So I just like went silent, and went dark on her for a couple months, and then I just showed up at the appointed time and place, mm -hmm. and she said, "You have two hours." <laughs> and um, so we had we took the two hours, and uh, you know it was you know it was it was as if we were still in high school, and things had not changed and. You capture that kind of reality in that way. I mean, with different people, you you approach them differently, and and with her, we had to just not rehearse. It had it could not be varnished. Um, I wanted to capture what it is, like what we're like in real life. It was it was um, it was it, yeah. That was good. I, I I hope we have time for some questions. Raise your hands, um, and and ask a question if you have one. In back. Okay, go ahead. I can't see you, but do it anyway. Oh. oh, us? Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. You were waving like crazy. Um, um, so George was a bit of a Spengali, like in the old footage and now and, and through the narration. There was something where you guys all continued to kind of show up for it. So we we're kind of, it's not Me Too-ish, but it was fascinating that he had some sort of charisma and even when you joined with the wife, the two of you had something extremely similar in how he was kind of hypnotizing in his creativity, I guess. Yeah, he was, he was a very interesting, he was, I, I would st still say that he was the best storyteller I ever met. I mean, the man lived in stories. His life, his entire life was made up of fragments and he was a composite, he was a mythological figure to himself and then he was a, he was a composite of all these movie characters. Too many to, to kind of put in here without sounding like a completely pretentious um, Wally, but but um, but but you know like he was made up of so many composite parts. George was um, so yeah he was he was fascinating. He um, the fact that he creates um, by destroying I find fascinating um, and you know because of my fascination I think I could not c completely find him villainous. I could not like you know vilify him and just dismiss him. Because I think um, there's something very interesting going on there, and so this making this film is almost kind of like a, almost like a conversation with this um, a ghost almost, kind of in a way. Any other question right here? So, are there any future plans to actually edit together the movie? Yeah. <laughs> recreate the sound. Recreate the sound. <laughs> okay, so so the thing is like you know at every screening you go to, and the, you know usually with younger people. Um, then, then you guys, um, <laughs> there's always like a, a bunch of like very energetic people who have not been, been disillusioned by the film business yet, and um, who, who would volunteer their services to join this Shirkers army in, in, in you know, like editing this, this, this thing together again. Um, well, the reality is that um, they're, they're, they're in disarray. I mean, the, somebody would have to be very super organized and, and kind of like, well, I don't know, just finding what, what real relates to what scrawl piece of paper Jasmine wrote, scrawled on in 1992, um, and, and how that all fits together. Um, and I think that would be a great project. I talked to a friend who actually runs the San Francisco Film Fest, Silent Film Festival, and she suggested, why don't you do it with silent titles? And, you know, because if you dubbed it, it would be so tacky. So I'm really resi resistant to that idea of dubbing it. But maybe it's a silent movie, movie it could happen. But, but first of all, I would have to find the the, the the tribe of dedicated un unsullied um, you know <laughs> non disillusioned young people who are talented enough to 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 put this thing together yeah it could work I love that moment where you show the films that reminded you or or you know like Ghost World and that that was great what what made you do that because that's how I felt at the time it was like when I saw Ghost World and I saw Rushmore and many other films I was like oh my God that is that is what we wanted to do. that is that but then I had no one to tell. I mean, I had no one to tell it to. It would just sound like a, you know, like a, nobody would believe me. And were there any documentary precedents for this in terms of inspiring you? Um, I was thinking a little bit of 
maybe Brett Morgan's Kurt Cobain movie, which had a collage effect. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, nothing. No, I, I, it's, no, I, no. Okay. I mean, I, I, or I saw Errol that movie. Morris, maybe? No? Um, no. None no, of that? I, no, no. It's, it's so, it's so, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I don't know. No, it's you. I know. <laughs> no, no, it's you I, I, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it, 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 was, it wasn't the case. All right. Anybody else? All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you, Sandy, so much.